All right. Last verse of that song, I love the text of Behold the Lamb. It says, Our call to follow in the steps of Christ as His body here on earth. And it's just a wonderful reminder that we are being called as Christ's body, belong to Him as a part of the church, and that then we are called to follow. In fact, we're looking at and just in, prep, in preparing our hearts for the Lord's table, just looking at these rea- realities, trying to remind ourselves of our realities of what it means to be a disciple-making church or the church committed to that uh, whole end. I mean, ultimately Christ is glorified, God is glorified. Uh, as we are followers of Christ who then make other followers of Christ. That's actually what we've been called to do. And so we put this up as our passion. You'll see it on the wall. It's over here in case you ever miss it. And it's meant to be there as a reminder. And we put it in print in various different ways. Uh, but it is meant to remind us that we need to be Christ-like disciples begins in a day of salvation. You need to be one, and that means there needs to be a time in your life where you've actually turned from sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And for all who are saved, then you should be following Christ. Amen? In fact, if you're not following Christ, you're probably not saved, okay? Uh, it's the call. Call to follow. So we're called to follow Christ, and so we begin that journey towards Christ's likeness. And on that journey towards Christ's likeness, we follow others. We don't just, we, we need flesh and blood examples. Jesus left heaven's glory, took on flesh and blood. We need flesh and blood examples. And so we need those in lives of others, and we need them ourselves. And so uh, we're called to follow other flesh and blood examples. Uh, we're called to run a race. Actually, it's a race of faith that is really uh, analogous of a marathon. And so if you've ever run in a, like a 5K, and that's not a marathon, obviously, it's really shorter, much shorter. That's been my extent of running. I've done the 5K a couple times. Uh, so, uh, it, it, but, you know, when you're running that, there's always people in front of you. That's a good thing. Well, unless you're the guy leading, I guess. But, uh, you know, so you have somebody in front of you, but there's always somebody in front. My point in the analogy is there's somebody to follow. And they tend to just kind of drag you along because when you get those times where you're ready to drop out of the race, the fact that everybody else is going, you're like, I, I can keep going. All right, so in the Christian life, you and I are to be following others, and there's always somebody in front of us in terms of their walk with the Lord. There's somebody that we're following, but the other side of that is uh, we tend to have thought, and we've tend to maybe even even taught this way, that you're not ready to disciple somebody else until you're almost to the finish line. Can I just tell you that you won't get to the finish line until glory? So that means you keep running, and you're always running, and there's further to go because on this side of glory... Uh, we're still sinners who need Christ to continue to change our life and make us a little bit more like Jesus every day. But the good news is that we can be involved in discipleship because there's always somebody just behind us. And so nothing will help you grow spiritually more than taking ownership for the spiritual growth of somebody else. You start getting involved in helping other people to grow, it will, nothing will cause you to grow more than you digging in and cause you in the Word more than when you start helping somebody else to grow. And so we are committed, and we need to be committed, that we're following. You ever, we should be following a Christ-like example. We should have somebody's life that we see as one worthy of emulation, and that it's not going to be a perfect life, because this side of heaven, the only perfect example is Jesus. But thank you, that thank, we praise the Lord, He's given us some people who are serious about their spiritual lives, whose, whose faith we can follow. And so we follow, and we learn to follow, and we also have to learn to lead. And like I said, you don't have to be that far in front. You just have to be in front. Which means when you're saved and you share the gospel with somebody and they come to Christ, you're already in front of them. Amen? So you can actually be the one discipling them. You don't have to go hand them off to some Mr. Discipler. There is no Mr. or Miss Discipler in the church. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. And what disciples do is make other disciples. I think we've tended to think that we win one after we grow up. So after I grow up and get spiritual, then I might actually take serious trying to win somebody to Christ, because after all, if I start too early, I won't have the answers. Look, the day you got saved, you had all the answers you need. You need to turn from sin, trust Jesus Christ. That's what people need to know first. Amen? All the rest of the questions they want to trip you up on to try and distract you are not things you actually need to answer. You need to start with the gospel. What they need to hear first is the gospel over and over and over again. And maybe, maybe that person you're sharing the gospel with will be like Stacy. It'll take 10 years before it sinks in. Right, Stacey? 10 years? 10 years of your brother sharing Christ and others sharing Christ. Uh, You know what? God's in the saving business, amen? 
And everybody in here needs to know this. If you're a Christian, there's one, at least one, for you to win to Christ. Do you believe that? I hope you believe that, because that's what Jesus teaches. So if you're a Christ-like disciple, it means you've been born again. You should be pursuing it by following others who are pursuing it, by helping others grow, and then by sharing Christ with others. And that really needs to be a passion. It is first. It comes first. Part of seek first the kingdom of God means you live this way. Amen? You're not living this way. We actually aren't living to please Christ, which then puts all kinds of questions. And so we call discipleship, or try to put a de- definition, a devoted follower of Jesus, eager to learn God's word, and longs to live God's way. If you don't want to learn God's word, that's a problem. If you want to continue to live your own way, that's a problem. The very nature of sin's deception makes us all rebels at heart. We want to live life our way in the world like we have a right to define that. We don't have a right to define our way in this world. This is God's world. He created it. He gets to decide how you live, whether you like that or not. He is the creator. He is the sovereign. And in fact, when you get saved, you stop rebelling against the sovereign and you start following. The nature of following. You follow. And we're going to talk about that more in Galatians today, being submitted to the Spirit. I like this. This really came out of our discipleship series on Wednesday night. That that demands that it's all of me is committed to all of him for all of my life. That's what it really means to be a disciple. And what I appreciate about what the guys at Grace Mentor did is they really dug in historically to just to demonstrate when Jesus called people to follow him to be his mathetes, which is the Greek word for disciple, it wasn't like they didn't understand what he was calling them to. They understood he was calling them to leave what they were before and become followers, all of them to all of him for all of their life. And so we were called to be followers of Jesus, and that following doesn't equal like I I pray a prayer so I can go to heaven. It looks like I turn from sin and self-autonomy, and I submit and begin following Jesus. That's why we call it being a Christ-like disciple, an actual follower of Christ. And so I long to live God's way in God's world, and that's the way discipleship should be. And so as Paul would write to the Thessalonians, and he he, he said that you became followers of us and of the Lord, and you received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Spirit, and you became examples. And here's this wonderful passage about what God did in the lives of people at Thessalonica. When they turned from sin, and Paul wasn't in Thessalonica long. In fact, the opposition welled up. He had to leave, but in the short period of time he was there, he saw a church formed. And they began to follow the Lord. And, and in fact, they were followers, Paul could say, you followed us, a Christ-like example, you followed the Lord, and the net result was their example, then they were an example that others could follow. I think I've mentioned this, you know, when there's a, a bumper sticker, it's also a t-shirt, I've seen it in both forms. Nobody's useless, at least you can be a bad example. Okay, so the reality is, is all of our, is there are examples, and the scary reality is that someone's following your example. Always the question is, is my example worthy of following? And if they follow my example, where am I leading? But you are an example. The question is, what kind of example are you? And where is your example leading others? And so we're committed as a church to this reality of living out discipleship. Why am I going through all of this? Because we're preparing for the Lord's table. And in this Lord's table, we're being reminded we're to do this as often as we do it in remembrance of Christ And we're reminded of the cost that had to be paid to rescue us from sin. Before I got saved, I was a follower of me. That's the reality. I was going to live like I I believe the lie of the devil. You you remember in the garden? Go all the way. This Bible story, by the way, is reality. It's not just a story, it's not a parable. It's really happened. Satan took up the form of a serpent and he, he spoke, and that should have been the first clue that something was desperately wrong. And then he called them to question God's rules and whether God actually uh, was, was kind or whether God was withholding. And he suggested that God was withholding. He said to Eve, on the day you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. And the very reason that humanity took of that fruit, Adam took of the fruit being there with his wife, is because they wanted to put themselves on even plane with God. This nature of my struggle with sin and all the people that you know that struggle with sin is we want to live like we're on plane with God, as in my opinion counts as much as his. That I have a right to decide for myself what's true for me, what's good for me. I can determine the direction and trajectory of my life. I can be, as the poet said, my master of my own faith. And all of that is a lie from the devil that began in the garden. 
And you and I need to be constantly reminded that our life, if we're in Christ, was bought with a price, a price of precious blood. That Jesus Christ left heaven's glory to rescue me from that kind of life. To give me new life, a new life that is now lived in submission to the Spirit, a life that follows Jesus. And so that means I am accountable to Jesus on how I live. Amen? You're accountable to Jesus how you live. You know what God did in His infinite wisdom? He gave us a church. He gave us a family, a community of faith, whereby we get examples that are following Christ. And they're not perfect examples. They fail. But they're following Christ, and we learn from their examples, and we help one another, and we walk together growing in Christ, and that demands an intentional accountability because I am accountable. And I'm helped by people that, that come alongside, will walk with me in this walk and help me to live better for Christ. Amen? You're helped by those kind of relationships and so then our, 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 lo- our minds must be saturated with the very Word of God. And then the good news is, if you're a child of God and your mind is being saturated by the Word of God, the Spirit of God will take that Word and keep changing your life. We didn't come in this room as perfect people. We came in this room as needy people. Don't know what your need is, but I know you're needy. And your need could be to come to Jesus in salvation today. And if it is, we've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. We've prayed that today would be a day you'd understand the gospel, repent, and believe. Your need today may be just to humble yourself and get out of Jesus' way. To stop reclaiming the reins and stop living for you and actually submit yourself humbly to the Spirit and say, Lord, I, I, I know you as Savior, but I haven't lived well as your child. I haven't followed well. And today I want to follow well. And so we can then be empowered by the Spirit ultimately to reproduce. You know, at the end of the life, you and I are going to, if you're a child of God, you get to spend eternity in the presence of God. Amen? Eternal life. We are partaking of this till the Lord comes because Jesus is coming. And that's good news if you're a child of God. If you're not, it's not good news for you, okay? It means you need Jesus, you need Him now because it could be today and that would be a glorious day for every child of God in this room. You know, I look forward to that day. I, I don't, every day, I, you know, as more I understand me and my own struggles and, and life in a fallen world, you know what? The more I look forward to Jesus coming. Because the day is coming when I'll never, never sin again. The day is coming when I'll never have the wrong attitude. Never, never be tired again. Do you ever get tired of being tired? Sometimes I just get tired of being tired. You know, life in a fallen world is hard. It spins you. It takes from you. It it sucks life out of you. There's a day coming when that life that I have in Jesus is going to be full and it'll be forever. And the joy of that salvation will be untainted by sin ever again. But the great joy of salvation is going to be being in the presence of the Lord, but also being with the people who helped shape Christ in me. The people who shared the gospel with me, the teachers that have taught me, but not only them, but all the string of people that strings into, uh, into human history of the people that shaped their lives. The people who shared Christ with them and helped them grow and walk. And all of those people for all eternity I'm going to get to spend glory with. But not only them, but all the people whose lives my life has touched. And not only those people, but all the lives their lives have touched. I mean, heaven's going to be fun, folks. It's going to be glory. You're going to be with people whose lives you've impacted and who have impacted you. Now, who are they? You were made to reproduce. Christ-like disciples make other disciples. Amen? We take the time in doing that because we really do want to remind ourselves as we partake of this why Jesus has called us, what he's called us to. We're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5 again, and as we do, uh, I'm going to put this text up for us to meditate on. But I just want two things, quick things, real quick, that I'm going to focus your attention on as you meditate uh, on this text. Is just a reminder that Jesus gave himself for our sins. It's just an important reminder that there is nothing anyone in this world can do to pay for their sins. There's no religion that can save anybody, only Jesus saved. There's nothing you're going to do to pay the debt of your sin. Only Jesus could pay that debt. The good news is Jesus has paid that debt. He's paid that debt so you can be forgiven. And he came, and note this text, he delivered us from this present evil age. To deliver us from this present evil age, it's just such an important reminder that you and I live in an evil age. If you need a reminder of that, just watch the news one night. Because you know the news glories in sin, right? 
It either is going to tell you about the worst thing somebody did, and maybe it'll, but it's going to glamorize it, sensationalize it, or it's going to celebrate human sin as some kind of accomplishment. One of the two or both happens all the time in the news. We live in a culture that celebrates sin like it's a human accomplishment rather than mourning it. But Jesus came to deliver us from this present evil age. That means you don't have to live as a citizen of this earth. You don't have to live in... You, don't, you and I actually have been delivered from this present evil age that we can live as citizens of heaven. Amen? That's a glorious truth. We'll talk about that more in the morning message uh, that we'll do after we partake of the Lord's table. I'm going to ask, invite you to read with me the text on the Lord's table. So if you can read from the screen, uh, you can follow there. If you, It's in your bulletin as well. I believe it's on page 8 of the bulletin. Uh, so I'm going to invite you to read this text with me as we prepare our hearts to receive the elements. So let's begin in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And ask the deacons to come as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. Put this text up in Galatians, which, I, I mean, you can read this, and you can go back to Galatians 5, where we'll be in our morning message. Again, Galatians 5, uh, beginning, really, we'll focus our attention this morning. We'll be looking at verses 24 through 26 will be our attention this morning, right after we partake together of the Lord's table. As we uh, prepare our hearts to receive, <clears throat> receive the elements, just a quick reminder uh, that the participation in the Lord's table, uh, the qualifications biblically, is that you know the Lord is your Savior, and that you then have followed the Lord in believer's baptism, an unashamed identif identification with Jesus. And so you follow the Lord in believer's baptism, and that means then you have, then the, the next one would be uh, that, and I, again, I, don't, I would not withhold from you if you're not a member of a local church. I would just admonish you to become one, okay? So that's the right following is that we trust the Lord, we baptize, we become a member of a local church. You do not need to be a member of this one. And then the final qualification is just an orderly walk. What I mean by that is just an honest desire to please Christ. If there's no desire to please Christ, there's no reason to take, okay? So we have an honest desire to please Christ. We partake. And we're asking in the process of do, in doing this, we're doing this in remembrance, and really to rekindle in our hearts the reality as what it was to be a lost sinner who was found by the great shepherd. I hope that's very real to you. And if it is real, then this is a very meaningful part of worship because we rekindle the affections of our heart knowing that we were lost sheep who Jesus came to find. So I'm going to ask Mr. Bob Carey, one of our deacons, to remember the Lord's broken body on our behalf. Cling to Christ. Marvel at the cross. Do remember what it was time because what you paid for us on the cross of Calvary by your body was broken. Dismiss your spirit to heaven and to return to earth again one day for us. Think of all these things that we consider. What this element means. Time of remembrance, we pray. Mindful of your coming again. In Jesus' name we pray.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's Mr. Les Crane to remember the Lord shed blood on our behalf. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for sending your son. You only perfect. Um, like, <clears throat> we only perfect sacrifice that could come and, and uh, pay the penalty for our sins. We are thankful for his <clears throat> willingness to die a terrible death. Death on the cross and blood would be that we would uh, remember the sacrifice made for us and willing, Lord, to sacrifice, be good disciples of uh, Jesus. In his name we pray. In the same manner, also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for this recurring reminder of what it is to be rescued from sin, the cost that was paid, the life that was lived that your son accomplished righteousness and lived a perfect life and then he willingly gave that life on a cross of Calvary that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Thank you that your son is redeemer, a rescuer. Thank you for each one here who partook freely of faith knowing 
Lord, that you are their father. That they've been rescued from sin's dominion and they are your children. Lord, I rejoice with them at your grace in their life. And ask, Lord, that you would work through your word to further transform us to make us even today a little bit more like Jesus. And for any that are here that have never come in honest saving faith to your son, today I pray, Lord, you would save them. Draw them to yourself that they may know the joy of salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We ask you to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. And while it, uh, I'm going to be sad, just to be honest, to leave this section of Scripture in terms of uh, what it means to walk in the Spirit and deal with the works of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. Uh, it's just a wonderful passage of Scripture. I almost wish I, we'd have memorized this in connection with the Lord's table, but you're only going to do so much memory work at one time, at least congregationally. Uh, but it's a wonderful passage of Scripture, and it is a tremendous reminder to us of what it means as disciples of Jesus Christ, as followers. In fact, if you look, and if you have your Bibles open, you actually look, uh, I'll just point to a couple things we'll touch on today. But back all the way back in 13, when he says, you've been called to liberty, do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And then he talks about what the flesh produces, their failure to love, actually to walk in love. And then he gives this text in chapter 5, verse 16. I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so there's a command walk in the Spirit. That command to walk in the Spirit is a command to live your life in submission to the Spirit. So I've given you a, a translation to try and bring that out to continually. So Paul is continually say he, he leaves this in every church and really that call uh, to come to Christ is a call to surrender from rebellion to following Christ, to live in submission, to put yourself under the authority you once lived in rebellion to. So to walk in the Spirit is to live a life of submission to the Spirit of God. And remember, if we're not living in submission to the Spirit of God, we are living in rebellion against God. There really is no middle position. If you've been rescued from sin, then you ought to live like it. Amen? If you've experienced the joy of God and salvation, the grace of God that's liberated you, set you free, so as he said, you've been set to liberty, liberty, that freedom that we've been given to, called to liberty, is not a liberty to do what we want. It's a freedom from the bondage of sin. We've been rescued from the dominion of sin, brought into the dominion of Christ, and so now we are to walk in the Spirit. We're to live in submission to the Spirit. And here's this amazing promise. That when you walk in submission to the Spirit, you stop doing the deeds of the flesh. That's a great promise, folks. And the only reason why that's not a great promise to you is you still love your flesh. If you understood, because when you look down in this text, you start seeing what the flesh produces. It's all like good stuff, right? I mean, look. I mean, he said, you know, flesh and the spirit, there's this internal warfare. We all know what that is. We know at times we want to do the right thing and the wrong thing comes out of our mouth. We want to have a right, a good attitude, but we don't. We want to be a good witness, but we're afraid. We know what it is to have those competing emotions of I want to do right, but I just don't find myself doing that. And, and that's an emotional turmoil that's going on inside of us. It's a spiritual battle because if you're a child of God, inside of you now dwells the very presence of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is leading you to obey God and your flesh is fighting every step of the way. And so there's that turmoil that goes on, but when you yield to the flesh, when the flesh has victory and wins the battles, you see the works of the flesh, which he starts highlighting in 19, adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousies, outbirth of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. I mean, it just keeps going. And it could even go, and such like these. And then there's the warning. Remember, people who live that way don't go to heaven. People who, whose lives are dominated that way, they don't go to heaven. Because the people who go to heaven are people who have been rescued from that kind of life. Amen? Salvation is a rescue ministry. Jesus came to rescue. And guess what? The Spirit of God is greater than your sin. And so that rescue is a rescue that has broken the bondage of sin to produce a whole new life, a whole new fruit. In fact, that's what the fruit of the Spirit. So the contrast could not be greater because the fruit of the Spirit begins that transformation of your life. And so there's this wonderful promise. Because here's the thing. You and I, every decision I make, all day, every day, are either going to be in submission to the Spirit of God, thus I trust and obey, 
Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And what that text is teaching us, and we need to be reminded of this constantly, is that I'm going to make decisions in my life that will flow out of faith, meaning that I actually believe what I'm doing is in accord with the Word of God and pleases God. If I don't believe that, then it doesn't come from faith, and I probably need to pause. Because if it doesn't come from faith, it's going to come from my fleshly desires. I want to do what I want to do. I want what I want. And when it calls out of my flesh, then I'm going to get all that fruit that comes from the flesh. You know, one of the things about the devil is he's such a good liar that he, 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 people are convinced of things that are, th- certain things are good for them that actually destroy them. It creates an upside view of reality. You know, many people that you've shared the gospel with, as I think uh, Randy was telling me a little bit of the story that Stacy didn't share fully in her testimony. So the first night after he got saved and he went to, and was witnessing to her, Stacy was a little upset. In fact, was a little loud about being upset and was kind of just telling Randy off about it and didn't really, and, and, and such, Randy's like, uh, come away from the wall, my neighbors are here, and she just turned and started just saying her disagreement with her brother right to the wall. She didn't care who heard. Uh, you know, when you start sharing the gospel with people, some people don't want to hear it, right? Now, the reality is, is the greatest news they could ever hear and the mo- thing that could actually is the, mo- the thing they need the most, the most valuable thing that I can ever share with somebody is the gospel. And Satan blinds them to what is valuable and they live in the things that are actually going to destroy them. And they live quite content to be there. They think their lives are okay, they're doing all right. Uh, they're morally probably in their mind, they're better than most, they're not something. Uh, so they just think, I can live my way, do my thing, and it's going to be okay. And the reality is, is the devil has simply blinded them to truth and they don't value what is really valuable. That's the way the flesh works. The flesh makes us unintelligent. I didn't say the S word. <laughs> the devil makes you unintelligent. It makes you make decisions of folly, just sheer folly. Because we make decisions that we believe are smart and they actually are not. They're actually decisions of rebellion. And so we need to live in submission to the Spirit so that we don't do the deeds of the flesh. The amazing promise is that's possible. Isn't that amazing? If you struggle with sin, this is a great promise. And if you don't struggle with sin, you're not alive. Okay, everyone in this room struggles with sin. I know that. Why? Because it's what the Bible teaches. You were born a sinner, and your natural bent is to sin and live your own way. Jesus, when he rescues you, rescues you from that dominion, gives you a new desires and new nature, so that you can now start obeying God, but you still wrestle with your own way. And you live in a world that celebrates sin constantly, parades it in front of you, you struggle with sin. Now, as one who struggles with sin, and you understand what sin actually brings, because if you sow to your flesh, you will reap of your flesh a lot of good things. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. When you let your flesh win the battle and you begin living there, you're going to reap from that destruction, corruption, ruined lives, ruin. In fact, this text highlights it. It ends with that reality. That if you don't live in submission to the Spirit, you'll actually become full of yourself, conceited. And in that concession of yourself, you actually then become one who becomes divisive. You see it in the text. And so it is good news that Jesus promises that you and I do not have to live in our flesh. That's an amazing promise. And so we can actually bear in our life good fruit, virtuous fruit. Something to be virtuous means it needs to be morally upright. To be morally upright does not mean that it is acceptable by people or popular in society. For something to be morally upright, it actually has to please God. And in salvation, God transforms our mind, renews our mind by the Word of God, enabling us to prove what is that good and perfect will of God. God's will is perfect, amen? God's Word is perfect. What God says is bad is bad. What God says is evil is evil. God is not a deceiver. God does not deceive you. What God says is good is good and should be valued. And the only reason why I don't value what God calls as good is because I'm still a sinner who is often deceived by sin. And so the fruit of the Spirit is virtuous fruit. It is morally upright. But it is also not just for you. It actually makes your life a blessing to others. God saved you to be a representation of himself to a world lost in darkness. Amen? 
God, God is making you a trophy of His grace. His work in you is so completely transformational that He makes us new. That's why the Bible calls us new creatures in Christ. That's good news. I mean, it's good news to be made new. It means that that slate of sin was cleansed, and the reality of my struggle with sin is going to grow smaller, but I am going to continually be transformed by the grace of God to be a little bit more like Christ. That means this kind of fruit can be seen in my life today, at least somewhat, and growingly so as I learn to walk, live in submission to the Spirit. I mean, we like to be around people that love you, right? Generally speaking, we don't get up in the morning and say, who can I find that really dislikes me and I want to hang out with them today? You know, today, I don't want to have any joy. I really would like to be cranky and just contrary. And I don't want to have any joy at all. And I certainly don't want to have peace. I want today just to be a wreck. I want to worry and be nervous. And I want to think everything's going to fall apart. That's what I want to do today. If that's you speaking in the mirror to yourself in the morning, then you need some help. You need to come get some help. Because that would not be a good thing, okay? Okay. We don't start our days there. We don't start there. But here's the thing. If I start out not actually going to the Word and asking the Spirit of God to rule in my heart and help produce this fruit, then all that ugly stuff comes out. The anger, the dissension, the wrath, the malice. All of that stuff starts coming out because that's all that can come from your flesh. In your flesh dwells how many good things? Do you believe that? Do you live like you believe that? This is where Paul is at. Remember what comes out of the flesh. You and I should be afraid of making decisions in our flesh. Let me say that again. You and I should fear living according to our flesh. It should drive us to the Word and to the Spirit so we could see this kind of fruit in our life and so love and joy and peace, which are those are the things that aren't rocked by your circumstances. You know, we live a life, I mean, so often we live how we feel. If I like certain things, and I've used the illustration, you know, different things that make you happy. So maple syrup makes me happy. I like maple syrup, okay? God moved to Cervant. He knew I liked maple syrup even before I did, All right? So, so, you know, will I, do I like things with maple syrup? Do I find reasons to put, cook bacon? Yes. Because I like bacon? Yeah, I do like bacon too, but I like maple syrup with my bacon. All right, did I volunteer to make candied bacon for the ladies' banquet? Absolutely. Why? Because I like it. And I wanted it, so I made it for you. I hope you like it too. But you know, I mean, you find reasons to do the things you like, the things you enjoy. And here's the thing. We tend to let the things we like rule in our life, so we have good day, bad day, good experience, bad experience, good meal, bad meal, happy day, sad day, all of those things go up and down and they're largely determined by our circumstance. And when I live that way, I'm actually not walking in the Spirit. Because when I walk in the Spirit, I have joy and I have peace regardless of my circumstances. When I'm walking in the Spirit, I love God and I love others regardless of my circumstances. When I live circumstantially, then I let my feelings rule my responses. And you know your feelings are deceptive? Folks, you know you cannot trust your feelings, right? Right? That doesn't mean you ignore them. You feel the way you feel. Okay? You feel that way. Now you've got to deal with all, why do you feel that way and how should you feel. And you can only begin to discern that through the Word. Do you know you and I cannot accurately interpret the circumstances in which we live? We think if we see it, we'd believe it. And because I feel it, it must be true. Those are lies from the devil. You know, when God spoke from heaven, people said it thundered. When Jesus did miracles and rose the dead, people said that was the devil that did it. Seeing does not equal believing. Believing is actually a gift from God and it comes from the Word by the Spirit. And only when your mind is actually being illuminated by the Spirit of God through the Word of God can you accurately understand your circumstances. That's why the Spirit of God produces fruit, love, joy, and peace no matter what your circumstances look like. Not only that, but the Spirit of God produces long-suffering, kindness, goodness. It's fruit that helps you be a light in a dark world. That God actually expects us to be witnesses to others. And so we're long-suffering. That means that we can put up with a broken world because we know it's broken. I don't expect this world to be filled with joyous things. I understand I live in a broken, fallen world, and it's going to be filled with painful realities. 
Because this world has fallen and it points me forward to the reality that my hope is not in this world getting better. My hope is in Jesus coming again. And that is a rock-solid assurance. Jesus is coming again. And when I dwell in His presence, all the suffering of this present life will seem as nothing. That doesn't mean the suffering isn't real. It's real. But the Spirit of God produces an enduring faith that doesn't get rocked by the difficult circumstances. It also enables me to be enduring with difficult people. So it enables people to continue to share the gospel and pray for those who aren't saved, who's rejected it, but you keep praying because why? The Spirit of God is greater than their rebellion. Amen? You wouldn't be here if it wasn't. If the Spirit of God was not greater than my rebellion, Billy Gocher never would have got saved. Because Billy Gocher was a rebel against God. Billy Gocher was going to live his own way. Billy Gocher had his own agenda. God humbled Billy Gocher. He got on his knees in a college auditorium and said, God, forgive me and save me. Without the Spirit of God actually slaying our rebellion, we, we would live in that rebellion. But we can be long-suffering with difficult people. We can be kind. And we should be filled with goodness. And the goodness, again, is that which pleases God. It's not what people call good. It's actually what God calls good. And it produces a fruit that actually enables us to be a, grace, to, to be a minister of grace to others. I mentioned it earlier, but before we took the Lord's table, at the end of life, you know, it's not he who has the most toys wins. It's not he who went on the most vacations wins. It's not he who had whatever. It, it, it really is going to be what you will enjoy forever is not going to be stuff you had here. It's going to be the people whose lives you help shape for Christ. You and I are meant to be reproductive. We're meant to impact people. And that means you and I, faithfulness to God is a part of the testimony to others. What, is God really worth it? Do you live for him? The people that you work with, your neighbors, your family, they know you're faithful to God. You can be counted on, and the, really the reality is you can be counted on to do the right thing in tough circumstances. That's ultimately when faithfulness tested. Faithfulness is not tested when everything's going well. In your marriage, your faithfulness is not tested when everything's going well. It's going, it's going to be tested when things are difficult. In your Christian walk, it's not going to be tested when everything's going well. It's going to be tested when it's hard to live for Christ. When people are challenging you and, and saying, I don't think it's worth it, or God hasn't been fair to you, or you're in that difficulty because God isn't good, and all those things the world, the flesh, and the devil want to lie to you about, that's when your faithfulness will be tested. Are you faithful? Do you do the right thing in difficult circumstances? We can be gentle, even when people aren't gentle to us. And we can live a life of genuine self-control, not being ruled by our emotions or circumstances, but actually by the Spirit. That is is what enables us to be a conduit of God's grace to others. And that brings us to this wonderful second section, which is that living in submission actually derails. This is how it works. That you do not have to produce fleshly living. You don't have to have that kind of fleshly response because of what God has already done in your life. And so he says in Galatians 5.24, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And so the first thing we need to understand is you and I can live in submission to the Spirit of God because we have, our flesh has been crucified. It is put as a perfect passive, meaning that God did it in the past and that reality continues in your life today. So my flesh, the day I got on my knees as a college junior and I asked God to forgive me and save me, that day my flesh was crucified. Well, what does that mean? It means before salvation I live a life dominated by flesh. Meaning my fallen sinful nature, which is selfish at its core, operated completely and ruled my heart. I had no other choice, no other option. I lived out the reality of being a sinner dominated by sin. The day of salvation, when I repented of sin and trusted Christ, then I am now raised to newness of life. The penalty of sin has been paid, but also the bondage to sin was broken. You see, what ruled my heart prior to salvation was my sinful flesh. And that day of salvation, I became a participant with the very crucifixion of Jesus Christ and that Jesus was crucified for sin and he was crucified to pay the penalty but also to break the bondage. Remember, Jesus just didn't, was not just crucified and died, he rose in victory over sin. So when I come to Christ and I am now in Christ, 
I am a participant in his victory over sin, meaning he's raised you from spiritual death to spiritual life, and now you are no longer under sin's dominion. It means the devil has no more claim. Amen? The devil has no more claim. Your flesh has no more right to rule your heart. You can now live in submission to the Spirit of God because your flesh has been crucified. It was put to death the day you got saved. That's why believers start living new lives. That's why you don't have to wait to some mystical point in the future when suddenly you know enough to be a witness. The day you got saved, you knew enough to share the gospel with somebody else. That would have been a good time for an amen. Not sure you're all convinced of it. But the reality is the day you got saved, you understood the gospel or you couldn't get saved. Amen? If you don't remember, before any child, anybody in this room can ever trust Christ, you have to actually understand the gospel. You actually have to be able to articulate why you're, what it means to be a sinner and lost and why Jesus is the only hope. You have to understand the gospel before you can actually believe it, right? Because belief is, actually involves your intellect, not just emotion. I mean, you can be scared of hell and say, I need Jesus, amen, but if you don't even understand who Jesus is or how he can save, that's not salvation. You don't know why you need to be saved. You can't be saved apart from actually understanding the gospel. When you come to understand the gospel, you repent and believe, you now know enough to share the gospel with somebody else. Please do not let the devil convince you you don't know enough to share the gospel with somebody. The moment you get saved, you can actually share the gospel with somebody else. Your flesh was crucified, dethroned. That means somebody else took up residency. Praise God, we know who that was, who it is. The Spirit of God came to dwell in us. God has always, always intended to dwell with His people. And in salvation, He comes to dwell with you. And so we have a new nature, and that new nature now can live in newness of life. And so while that happened in the day of salvation, we're called to continually live out that reality. The day you got saved, if you would have died, you would have went to heaven. Amen? Anybody, everybody got that? The moment you got saved, that moment you had eternal life, if your life ended in that same moment, if you were the thief on the cross saying, today remember me in paradise, and Jesus said to you, today you will be with me in paradise, you went to heaven. Amen? So somebody gets, can somebody get saved on their deathbed? Absolutely. You get saved today and gone tomorrow, you're in heaven in the presence of God. Okay, so the, that reality is true. And here's the other reality. The day you got saved, your flesh got crucified. But the work of God in purifying you from the flesh is not going to be finished until you're in glory. That means all along that run, that's why it's called the, the race of faith or the fight, the good fight of faith. Do you know it's a daily battle to actually live by faith? Do you know who your battle's against? Do you know who the enemy is? If you don't know who you're fighting, you're in trouble, right? You've got to know your enemy. So the devil is an enemy. Everybody got that, right? All right, the devil's an enemy, and what have you been called to do? Well, you've been called to draw near to Christ, and the devil will flee far from you. So that enemy, what do I do? I draw to Christ. You have a second enemy, the world. Do not be a friend of the world. Do not love the world, or you will be the enemy of God, Right? So you're not to love this world. You recognize it's a present evil age. That means you doubt the world's value system. If you don't doubt the world's value system, you're a sucker. Okay, scams happen every day. My mom just emailed me this week. She said, what do you think? And somebody had sent her an email, some believer from some other, you know, you know what the scam is. It's from, you need to call these people. And there's, there's, there's you know, some $18 million they're going to put in your account because they just found you. And praise God, they want to put it in your account. Of course, once you give them your account, your account will be empty. My mom contacted me, and I said, Mom, it's a scam. Don't contact anybody. Somebody was just scammed like $42,000 last week, 92-year-old man. Scams happen all the time because people believe people, and people are liars. God is a truth teller. So the day you got saved, you, that, that, that old flesh died. And you need to fight against the enemies that will encourage you to live in that old way. So the devil's going to do that. The world's going to do that. But here's the other thing. Your flesh is still your flesh. I became a new creature in Christ in the day I got saved because the Spirit of God came to dwell in me. 
So I have a new nature with a new disposition and new, new desires, but I still have the old nature. I still have the propensity for sin. It left to myself, I'm still selfish. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. Ask my children. They've all seen me at my worst because they live with me all the time. Do you know you're still selfish? Do you know at times you act out of self-interest and in that moment you sinned against God? And so you have a battle that you need to fight every day with you. The biggest battle I fight, the biggest battle you fight to live for Christ is with myself. It's with you. You fight you. And what you say about you and what you say about your need of Christ is, is ongoing reality. And so we put to death, called in our memory verse, to put to death our members which are, are, are on this earth. Let me just bring this really kind of in summary as we're looking at what time it is. The living in submission of the Spirit derails the desires of our flesh. So we can live in submission because we are actually spiritually alive. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. The word for walk here is different than the word earlier. When we're commanded to walk in the Spirit, it's peripateo. means you walk in this way. So live in submission underneath the authority of the Spirit. This one is more of a military term. It's to fall in line. For all of you military guys that ever were in pray march, and you marched and you followed, you, you stayed in order. And you followed. And if you didn't and you got out of order, somebody was not real happy with you. Okay? This is a call to fall in submission. The call of submission is now to fall in line. In fact, many modern translations, or several modern translations, would translate that second walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Because the imagery is getting in a marching line, and there's the leader. Follow that leader. The Spirit lives this way. You follow the Spirit. That's why it's often translated, keep in step with the Spirit. But the first condition Paul puts is an if, and it's really an if, and I believe you are. He's talking about the Galatian believers. Since you are alive in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you, you now can live a life directed by the Spirit. Amen? So he is saying if, and I believe it's true, but for some in Galatia it isn't true. That's why he used the conditional sentence. If, and he is saying, if, and I believe it's true. That's what he would be saying in the Greek language. If, and I believe it's true, at least for most of you. You're alive in the Spirit. Now you need to walk in the Spirit. You need to follow the Spirit. Keep in step. Keep following the Spirit. And so we can say no to the flesh. You don't have to have, you look at those works of the flesh, your life doesn't need to look like that, amen? Do you know when God saves sinners, he delivers them from that kind of sinful life? Adultery, fornication, enmity, anger, wrath, malice. He delivers them from that kind of life. We don't need to live there. We get delivered from there, and we're called then to follow the Spirit's leadership. The Spirit of God will never lead you to sin, amen? Never. It's going to produce virtuous fruit. And so you can, we can say no to the flesh, and we can live according to the Spirit. And here's the warning. If we don't, this is what happens. We become conceited. You know what conceited people are. They're people who think a whole lot of their own opinion. In fact, so much of their own opinion that they actually think it's better than God's. The moment you follow that deception and your opinion is as valuable as God's, you've actually stopped walking in the Spirit. The moment you stop walking in the Spirit, you will become conceited. You're going to try and figure out life on your own which is the height of arrogance and folly. And the moment we become conceited, we now start provoking one another. Only this isn't the positive provocation. This isn't the Hebrews provoke one another love and good works. This is the let me know your weakness and exploit it. Let me hit you where it hurts. Because when I become full of me, I want to put you down. This is what was happening in the church of Galatia. In fact, if you look back up, in fact, it says that they're biting and devouring, they're consuming one another because they're failing to love one another. Galatians 5, 13, 14, or, uh, 14 and 15. So the church of Galatia was struggling because they were not living in the Spirit. They were not walking in the Spirit. And they were becoming conceited, and their conceit was creating provocation and envy. And it was all the biting and consuming that was going on in the church because they were failing to what? Walk in the Spirit. And Paul is simply saying, listen, the solution to the problem 
is you have to fight against the flesh. The good news is the flesh was defeated in, in salvation. So in your battle against sin, you can have the victory. That's what he's saying. Galatians, you don't have to live this way. This doesn't have to be your life. All that ugliness that the flesh produces, that doesn't have to be you. Jesus died to rescue you from that. You can live a new life. Just start doing it. How? By humbly submitting to the Spirit of God. And you'll live a new life. Because when we walk in the Spirit, we no longer do the deeds of the flesh, the promise. This isn't a call to work harder. It's not. It's not go try harder. It's a call to live out the reality of your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've come to know and love Christ, now live it. Well, how do I do that? I live in submission to the Spirit of God. How do I do that? I get into the Word, and I say, God, help me. Teach me. Direct my steps. We humble ourselves, and we daily go to a throne of grace, and we ask for help. We humble ourselves, and we say, God, I don't have the wisdom to do this on my own. Teach me. Do you know that God will do all of that? How do I know? Because he promises in his word, and God always keeps his promises. Amen? You can live a new life. You can live a life dominated by the Spirit of God if we will simply submit our hearts to God. Sin's bondage has been broken. You don't have to live there. You do not have to live there anymore. Children of God have been set free. That's good news for the children of God. If your life is still in burdened and bondage to sin, maybe your great need today, no Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving sinners like us. I thank you for the greatness of your love and kindness and your long suffering and mercy with this sinner. Lord, you in grace reach down and open sinners' eyes and you grant faith and you rescue us from perishing. You claim us to be your very own and Lord, thank you, you don't leave us alone. You walk with us on this journey. You walk with us. You grant us your spirit. You've given us your word. And you've made this amazing promise that if we will simply yield our hearts and say yes to you, you will keep us from the flesh. Lord, as we look at these lists and we know the internal struggle it is, we know as we live in a world that so often sin is celebrated, life seems upside down, the things that are invaluable aren't valued in our culture, the things that are destructive are. And our hearts get tainted by that kind of mess in which we live. And oftentimes we put our hopes in things that are not worthy. Lord, draw us to yourself. Feed us by your word. May your spirit have free course in our hearts. Thank you that Jesus died to rescue us from sin. Now, may that reality be lived out as we yield ourselves to your word by your spirit. And then our lives get directed. Our steps, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Order our lives, Lord. Help us to enjoy the victory from sin that comes through a life of walking, keeping in step with the Spirit. Lord, help us to fall in line. Come under your authority and your word and may your Spirit direct us to please you. Lord, may we look at the fruit that's in our life. May we do, even as the Lord's table commanded us to do, examine ourselves, look at the fruit. Look at your text, and does our life look more like the fruit of the flesh, or does it look more like the fruit of the Spirit? Lord, we should know who's winning the battle more days. We need to know the enemy, and we need to know the armor. And Lord, we need to draw near to you and put on the full armor. That we might battle against flesh, say no to flesh, and say yes to you. Lord, you know where every struggle is. You know the difficulties faced. You know the trying circumstance of life in a fallen world. And Lord, you've chosen to walk with us through that by the presence of your Spirit in the lives of your children. Help us to yield to your Spirit's presence. Live a life of honest submission to you. That we would walk in the Spirit. Lord, I thank you for your children, each one you've made alive here. And I pray, Lord, you'd encourage our heart with your word and the promises you've given that you've broken the bondage of sin to enable us to live a new life now. I pray for any that are here that have never come to Jesus in honest, saving faith. 
that even today would be a day of salvation. Thank you for loving us, for dying for us. We pray that you'll help us now to live for you.